Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Purple Stars podcast. My name is Sarah. I'm your host. And we have another amazing guest for you. She's an actress, voice and communication coach, a big dog lover, and above all, a very inspiring human being. And I can guarantee you, you will love her journey and the story she is going to share with us. Please welcome Kirsty Strait. Hello, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for being here. We are really excited because you are traveling a lot. So it's even nicer to have you on the show and to make it happen today. We are going to dive right in. My team told me you shared that the Rocky philosophy saved your life. We are curious, in what way did it save your life? And what were the life lessons you learned from that philosophy? Okay, so that that is a pretty big question to kick us off because I could spend a whole podcast talking about that. But so I'm talking about when we talk about the Rocky philosophy, I'm talking about the films, right? I'm talking about Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone. And so ultimately, as a kid, I was really unwell. Um, so quite severely unwell and to the point where there were occasions where even just breathing was difficult. And so for me, for the majority of that time, television was my only lifeline, really. It was my only window to the life outside, life beyond this existence of illness that I was living in. And so I was introduced to the Rocky films and it, it started with the fourth one, actually, having the first initial impact so with in the fourth one you know Rocky's toughest opponent is Ivan Drago now for me I was going through a lot of mistreatment and a lot of misdiagnosis and I didn't have a, a diagnosis for my illness and I was trying to make sense of what was going on with me given how unwell that I was and I started to think about it Ivan Drago is Rocky's toughest opponent and he's knocking him down and he's beating him and he's this is the biggest fight of his life well that's what this feels like this is like the biggest fight of my life this is I'm in this ring and I'm I'm in a boxing match here this is what this is this is what this feels like and it gave me a way to personify my illness it gave me a way to communicate with it it gave me a way to understand it as a child at a deep level and so that sort of became the first stepping stone into exploring these films I went back to the first one now the first one is the absolute best one out of all of them but they're all amazing in their own way and it started to lead me to these different nuggets of wisdom and insight of how how we live with ourselves you know the Rocky films well the first one especially the first one is a love story right but what happens within that love story not only between Rocky and Adrian is that they learn to love themselves through the love of each other and they, they in and there's a scene in the first one that almost didn't make it into the film because they were running out of time and Sylvester Stallone said no it's a necessary scene it's really important and so they did it in one shot and one take and it's when he's been walking around all night he can't sleep and he comes home and he says to Adrian I can't do it I can't win so all I want to do is go the distance all I want to do is go the distance with Creed because if I can go that distance and I'm still standing, then I'm going to know I'm not just another bum from the neighbourhood. And what he's saying is, is I want to rise up to meet myself. I want to rise up to meet my full potential, to know what I've got capable inside of me. And so that was just a nugget of wisdom. And then you look at the flashback scene in Rocky Five, where where Mickey's saying to, to Rocky, you know, nature's smarter than people think. I love that line, nature's smarter than people think. You know, he's, he's talking about how we keep losing, we lose our friends. We, you know, we keep losing and losing until we think, oh, what, what have I got to, to be around here for? I've got no reason to go on. I need a reason. I need a purpose. So connecting with your purpose in life and what gives you purpose and what moves you forward. The films talk about fear a lot, making fear your ally, living with fear. The third one, when he has to go into a rematch with Clubber Lang and he's terrified and Adrian says to him, well, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. You're human, you know? And he's like, well, what if I lose? And she says, well, at least you lose with no excuses and I know you can live with that. And that's about... If I give everything I have, if I give all that I have and I and I still fail and I still lose, I can live with that because I, I know I've done the best that I can. 
And then Balboa, you know, has that huge speech, you know, about taking the hits and keep moving forward and, you know, it's your right to listen to your gut and then he talks about stuff in the basement and how to live with grief and so all through it there's all these lessons and relationships and the characters represent different moments um, and, and different aspects of life so to me the films really started to serve as a, as a purpose of how do I live with myself how do I understand life I was trying to make sense of things at a very young age and it just gave me a way of making sense of challenge of making sense of hardship of making sense of those difficulties and they were really about teaching me how to to be my own champion and how to rise up to meet myself and where I could find those little moments of of inspiration so it was quite literal in its saving of my life because there were moments during that those really difficult years of illness where I just I didn't know if I had the capacity to keep going with something like what I was living with and it was like just having that to grip onto just that little something would pull me up and keep me going oh I didn't hear no bell I'll keep going and and so, I mean, I'm sure that Sylvester Stallone didn't think when he was writing these films that some wee girl in Glasgow was going to connect with them in this way and, and make them her life lessons. And, and, and I sort of grew with the films. And every time I watch, even now, every time I watch them, something else comes up for me, another bit of wisdom, uh, another lesson. Yeah, I mean, I named my dog Adrian Balboa. It doesn't get much more fandom than that. <laughs> I was about to say, because I know that your dog is called Adrian. I thought, mm, okay, now we know the connection. <laughs> yeah, so her full name actually is Adrian Balboa. So sometimes when I'm calling her, I will say, Adrian Balboa, what are you doing? So yes, she has, it's her full name. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that your dog has a full name. Can you share a little bit about Adrian, your dog, and how she's helped you on your health journey and also maybe how she's helped you to implement even more the lessons of the Rocky philosophy? I mean, Adrian came to me during the pandemic, which was a, an interesting time for everyone, I think. The biggest thing I've... I mean, she's my world now, but it, there's something about that connection that we make. I mean, she's a rescue. She came to me all the way from Bahrain, so she really went through it herself. She, you know, she came to me with huge anxiety and she was looking for a place of safety in the world and a place to feel home and to feel secure. And we had to build trust. We had to build trust together and she has to build trust with everyone else that comes into her life and that takes time. And so... Again, I'm always looking for the lessons now. I'm always looking for the teachable moment and what and everything that comes into your life and every soul and every being, there's something, there's a teachable thing. There's just, there's an exchange. There's a gift of that relationship, you know? And so for Adrian, she taught me even more about patience, even more about compassion. Um, and here was this soul, this other being that I have to care for and and protect and look after and nurture and you know and support and be there for and in a weird way you know they say that your dog kind of chooses you and you know she is a rescue but I felt like she was rescuing me in some ways with that pointing my focus in a new direction and, and again in those moments if I can be compassionate for her if I can care for her and love for her I can transfer that back to myself I can give that back to myself and she's so loving and the way that she is, she's the sweetest, you know, she really, really is. She gave me all of that. And that's, that's huge. She, she gives way more than she'll ever ask for. I think that's something really precious about dogs as well. I think they give, they give way more than, than they ever get back in return, I think. Dogs always remind me of, I think Emily Sunday sang in one of her songs, I'm giving everything so I have nothing to lose. And it's a little bit what you said mm. about the movies. If you lose, at least you at least you lose with no excuses. And that's something dogs just have naturally. They open their heart. They give so much love, even after having been through a lot of trauma, which in Adrian's case was probably a lot. Yeah. And she opened up again and she's giving you all the love and the attention. And she also trust 
trust that you are your home, her home now, that you keep her safe, that you're not going to disappear or abandon her, and that you love her even if she's doing something naughty. <laughs> it's one of the great lessons we can learn from dogs or also other animals is to be present and to give our all, whether it's having fun, resting, being patient, loving, just like being fully in, fully in. And that leads me to my next question. When it comes to your health journey, could you share a bit about your illness and also what helped you to fully heal? I first became ill when I was nine. I got glandular fever when I was nine and I didn't fully recover from that. And it was just an ongoing decline that led to a multi-system, multi-symptom illness of severe chronic pain, muscle pain, joint pain, joint stiffness. I had um, chronic migraine. I had temperature control issues. I had sensitivity to light and sound. I had blurred vision. I would have numbness in my arms and legs. I would have just an array of symptoms, crippling, severe exhaustion that was in effect painful. I couldn't, there were periods of time where I couldn't eat properly. I couldn't speak because it was just too much. I couldn't have other people speak to me unless they were on a, on a low whisper because even that, you know, was just too much and too painful. So there were times where I had to just lie in a darkened room and couldn't do anything at all. And there was just nothing showing up, test after test after test. I was then, by the age of I think 12, I was labeled with chronic migraine and depression and phobic anxiety. Now, by that point, my mental health was starting to uh, suffer quite badly with being so severely unwell. And this went on for years. They, they put me on beta blockers and they put me on antidepressants. Then they, you know, and it just went on and on and on the cycle of, of, um, of just n no progression, just decline the whole time, just decline, decline. And then, you know, my mum sort of started to take things into her own hands and look at alternative health options and looking at, right, okay, we don't have a, a, a diagnosis, but we have a, a, an array of symptoms. We can start to just work with the symptoms, looking at alternative health options. And then I was doing some reflexology and Reiki with this person who was suggested, well, has ME ever been ruled out? My allergic encephalomyelitis, I was like, I don't know anything about that. Oh, well, we should look into that. Went to my doctor with it, and then they sent me to this Department for Infectious Diseases was where they could send me. And through that, it, they confirmed, yes, we would diagnose this as uh, as, fit, as fitting with uh, severe ME but you're already doing everything that we would suggest to do. There's not really anything that we can do. And that was basically it. We were kind of let out, left with that. So, and I was 17 by that point. So that's eight years. And at 17, going into being severely bedridden. And so then it became a whole other battle of progression of, right, we're not getting anywhere you know, here, let's look at this alternative route even further. What can we do just to even deal with symptom management? So it became about symptom management and strategy for me for a long, long time. And as you know, you name the treatment, I've likely tried it over the years from everything from homeopathy to kinesiology, Chinese herbal medicine, you know, as I said, Reiki, reflex, like it, it just is constant. I think I even saw a faith healer at one point. It just was like that. It went on and on. And so there was all of the physical impact of that alongside that, all of the mental health and emotional impact of that as well on my social development, educational development, my well-being, the living with that level of chronic pain and, and battering of symptoms and then the isolation that comes with that as well. And then you're constantly, you know, seeking and searching. And so eventually through some various alternative, you know, alternative health healing modalities, I managed to get to a point of plateau where my health improved to a level that I was able to go back into education so I could study and work. 
but it was still in a negotiation with my symptoms and what it is with me there's like a sliding scale so 100% is symptom free no symptoms 100% the lower that percentage the more symptomatic you are and so for me I managed to get to a workable plateau of about you know more more recently it was like 75% six, six you know 70, 70, 75%. But throughout my years of, it would swing like a pendulum. It would go back and forth, swinging like a pendulum. So I would, I would have periods of having to drop out of education again. And then, you know, be a year and a half rehabilitation back into education again. Or I have to dip out of work now for so many months and then build myself back up to a level, a workable level. And it was always like that. Um, and then, to about almost two years ago I would say two years ago almost two years ago I got COVID and that gave me another knock because any chest infection any flu any viral infection any bug would have an impact it would have that kickback it would exacerbate everything that I was just keeping a lid on Um, and so then I started to look at things through a slightly different lens um, and that's what took me into looking more deeply at um, trauma and its impact on the body physically and how the physical mas- manifestation of trauma, the work of Gabor Mate, Compassionate Inquiry and through that I discovered plant medicine, began to do work with that and with other somatic practices and that changed things for me massively in where I'm at now with my health which is to be symptom free and I have been symptom free now for the last almost eight months I mean I had been on painkillers and living with chronic pain for 30 plus years and to be at this point of sustaining painkiller free pain free symptom free energy levels up but you know and that's been for the last almost eight months of my life uh, wow. versus you know the 30 plus years of my life in this constant negotiation and master strategist of, you know, everything had to be thought out before in terms of my activity because any activity would create a post-exertional kickback for me. So I had to always sort of be like this master strategist of what can I take on? What am I allowed to do? You know, if I'm doing that, then I'm only doing that. Now things are opening up for me a lot, lot more, and I'm in a I'm in a rehabil- rehabilitation phase with my body because I've never really been able to exercise. So for the first time in my life, I'm feeling at a level where I feel like that's okay, but I have to rehabilitate my body because I I have to build stamina. I have no muscle tone. I have to build strength, um, flexibility. That's all gonna. That's a whole new phase I'm entering into now where I'm like oh my body can cope with that but again I still have to just I'm just being mindful of how I do that just to keep things on that healthy level because the other thing is you can get greedy for health as well you you know and and it happened before like if I would get to a symptom fee level or even be at about 65 70 percent I would want life. I would be, you know, and I would want to grab and do, and and I'd hit that overexertion rate. So I'm mm. I'm in a new I'm in a new world now. It's a whole new world of you know to be completely symptom free and sustaining that. It's still a new world of what is life like here. What is healthy point of balance in terms of what I do with my level of exertion? What is my healthy balance with that? So I'm just looking at that on a, on a deeper level as much as possible. Kirsty, for the listeners who are not familiar with ME, could you share just in a few sentences what it is, what the symptoms are, and also what helps you now to find and keep your personal balance? And what are your go-tos to stay symptom-free? So ME... Myalgia against myelitis is a very, it's often described as a very flu-like condition, but I think it's, it's, it's a complex multi-system, multi-symptom illness that just, it's, the body just doesn't have the same resources to deal with well, to deal with exertion or to deal with infection or to deal with the, the recovery rate. So like you go for a shower and you don't even think about it. 
I would go for a shower and I would need to rest for a good number of hours. I might not even have been able to do anything else. Everything costs. So everything, it's like there's, there's a, there's this, I don't know if you've heard of the spoon theory. It's a bit like that where it's like I have so many spoons and if I, if I use that one, then, you know, and so you only have so many and it's like, or, you know, the other thing of a battery, it's going to, it goes down. You only have that much battery life, but everything, everything costs me a certain percentage of battery or it costs me a certain number of spoons where a lot more than anyone else. And there's a, they would call it post-exertional malaise, but I would call it post-exertional kickback. Because basically what would happen is if you do something, then there would be your, a, a, a punishment to the body physically in terms of your symptoms. So the symptoms can can really be, you know, wide and varied. And in my case, that severe crippling exhaustion where it doesn't matter even if you sleep, you're not rested. You never ease in your body. Every part of you is aching and sore. Um, so it, your skin can be sensitive and tender to touch. You, you, you have real extreme muscle aches, real joint pain, joint stiffness, chronic migraine, blurred vision, temperature control issues. So I could end up being really, really cold or really, really sweating hot or, you know, sensitivity to light and sound, just the inability to be active in any way you know and 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 the swing of that depending on the level of severity so the more severe you are the more symptomatic you are the the more you know pretty much bedridden you are to be honest and then you know it goes on it goes on that sliding scale of percentage and what what has helped you or what helps you right now to boost your health, to love your body, to support its natural rhythms, whether you need more rest or whether you can, you know, have more energy, because I know you're an actress, voice and communication mm -hmm. coach. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot of energy. So I'm wondering, how do you, how do you take care of your own battery? Well, I think it's about tuning in. And one of the biggest things, I mean, now to be at this level where I've come to to be symptom free is a new one for me and to be sustaining that. And I think I have a, a whole new relationship with myself now at this point, but I'm listening to myself completely. I'm acknowledging myself and I'm listening to myself and I'm being honest with myself about what, where I'm at. I think acceptance is a huge thing in terms of I'll accept this moment and I'll work with it in order to move me in the direction that I want to move in so that I still have that aspect of master strategist within me because I developed it. But it's a tuning in and self-care is, is paramount to that. I think even if you've never been ill, even if you're a, a healthy person, there's a certain level of self-care that we all need. You know, there's a certain level of, you know, rest that's important or doing certain things that are, you know, beneficial just purely on it from a mental health perspective or for, for a well-being perspective you know learning that it's all one system as well and not separating myself so much and, and wanting to look to integrate so mind spirit body every part of myself it's one whole system and one thing impacts the other so connecting those things and allowing those things to have a relationship with each other and a communication with each other so that I'm working with my whole self. I'm acknowledging my whole self and I'm taking care of my whole self, what I feed myself. Yes, the food that I eat and the nourishment that I give myself, but what I consume, what I read, what I listen to, what how I structure my time you know, how I, f even how I feel about myself, because I used to have to deal with stress management because any, any form of stress would have an impact on me physically massively. So I would get hugely emotional about what I was going through, but that would only serve to, to be more destructive because, you know, that would have an impact on my physical health even more so. But then I've got to acknowledge my feelings because that's healthy. I've got to find a way to sit with my feelings in a healthy way and acknowledge my feelings in a healthy way. And so it's just getting to know myself and, and listening to myself and being my own measuring stick as opposed to, 
oftentimes when I was younger, it would be externally looking out and what do, what should I be achieving by society standards of achievement and what, what do I need to catch up with the rest of the world and blah, blah, blah. If I go back to the Rocky lesson about rising up to meet your full potential and going the distance, that was about him and him. That was about him rising up to meet himself in a moment. So I always just ask myself on a daily basis, where are you at today? What have you got capacity for today? And being honest about that and being my own measuring stick for that. And then I'm giving the best of myself in every moment because that's important to me. Then I'm losing if I lose in whatever way that is. I have, there's no excuses because I've, I've offered everything I have to offer and, and I can, and, and that's all I have and that's all I can do. And that's all I can do in any moment. And I have to do that respectfully and kindly and compassionately. Otherwise, you know, it could have an impact on my body and it has done in the past. So I think for me, my health check, spiritual health, mental health, physical health are all connected, all integrated. And they're all about me just being honest with myself, I think. What helped you to come to the point that you are your own champion? Because that's how it sounds like. And that your thoughts are fighting for you rather than against you. And that you have the courage to be honest to yourself. Because I'm a big believer. It's one thing that a lot of people are afraid of to be honest, whether it's to themselves or others about how things are, how they feel. It's, you know, like that honesty and being vulnerable, like what helps you with that? I think it's come out of experience. <laughs> I think <laughs> initially to be my own champion, that started with, you know, the way, you know, as I've talked about Rocky inspiration. But I think As a young child, not having belief in myself, but my mother definitely did. And she fought for me a lot of the time when I couldn't fight for myself. So I was very lucky. I was in a privileged position of, that I had a parent there that was fighting for me when I couldn't really fight for myself and was being my strength for me when I didn't have strength for myself. And so then as the, as the time went on and I really looked at you know as I was exploring different healing modalities and I was having different experiences and I was meeting different people along the way I started it, it was a lesson that kept coming back to me time and time and time again about you know connecting with myself believing in myself accepting myself and I think sometimes and I think it's a wonderful thing when we believe in other people believing in other people when they're not able to believe in themselves it teaches them how to do that It teaches them that they are worth that. And so I was lucky enough to experience that. But there, there comes a point where, well, for me anyway, there came a point where I knew I had to be that for myself. I just, otherwise my life was never going to be on solid ground. And I was always going to be looking outside myself for answers and solutions. And I was always going to be comparing myself and measuring myself and then that was never going to be enough. And I'm, you know, acceptance doesn't mean that that you draw a line in the sand and you say, oh, well, I, I accept this and that's it. But acceptance with the ability to, to not have resistance. So what I, what I came to learn was that when I was swimming against the tide of life, right, when we swim against the tide, it's like we thrash around, we're drowning, we're just going to drown and we're going to exert ourselves. When we go with the flow of what is, we move. The current moves, nature moves us. We will move. It will move. Might not move at the pace you want it to. Might not happen in the way that you want it to, but it will happen and it will move. And it made everything just breathe easy within me. So as things happen, as challenges happen, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that. I'm not going to deny its existence. I'm not going to fight against it. I'm not going to resist what is. I'm going to take what is. I'm going to accept what is. And I'm going to be with myself with that. And I'm going to use that as my guideline for moving forward in whatever way that's going to be. I so deeply that resonated. Mm, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> no, I was just going to say, I guess <laughs> life taught me it in, in the long run, you know, you just learn through that, that experience. It's, it really shows what your belief is. And you, you share with me, one of your biggest belief is that in anything we can find a light. And I like to say any experience holds gift for, gifts for us, even the most painful one. And the most traumatic one, the ones where we feel lonely, where, where we feel so much heartache and grief and despair. And it might take time for us to understand and to see and also to accept the gifts. But we, if we're willing to receive them, those experiences can really propel us forward. And they can just make life so much more beautiful. Mm. I mean, I found that to be a great survival tool for me because whenever something happens, it's like, well, wh what is it teaching me? What is it giving me? You know, one of the biggest things that came out of being so so unwell, so young, was that it taught me not to take anything for granted at all. Everything's a privilege. Everything's a bonus. Oh, I'm I'm up in the morning. I'm in the shower. I've got clean running water. I'm, you know. I'm dressed today, I'm working today, I'm with people today. Everything for me, because I was at a point of, there was nothing. So for me, everything is a privilege. Everything is a moment. Everything is a gift. Everything is a lesson. Everything, it really is. In every bit of darkness, there is that bit of light that's there. And it's meant for you for something. That's why it's there. But, I mean, that's how I look at it. It's there to serve me, to serve a purpose in some way, whether it's to, to, to make me more resilient, whether it's to make me more compassionate, whether it's to just to make, to make sure I do realize that, that I, I should take nothing for granted and that every moment is a gift and to be grateful. Gratitude is another massive practice that I've really learned to lean into because even in the most hor horrific situations, there will be something. And, and like for me at one point, it was like, well, you're breathing. Just, just be here and just breathe. You have that. Oh, now because I'm doing that, I can be mindful there's a breeze coming in through the window and it feels quite nice on my face. Okay, I'll just, I'll be with the breeze then because that feels nice. Oh, and now I can hear birds and they're, and, and, and they're fine. They're at that distance and that I can, I'm happy with that. I can hear those birds in that life there. You know, and it's like that. And it just, you just mindfully just let, even if it's so small, you just lean into that and, and, and go from one thing to the next in, in that way of one bit of light will lead you to the next, will lead you to the next, no matter how small. And it, you know, because we can get in those moments and those situations of hopelessness and, and despair and feeling like, That's, what are you talking about? This is the worst. There's, there is nothing. But if, if you can make that simple act of breathing a privilege and then the breeze on your face and then the, whatever it may be for you, it, that allows things to grow and expand and you'll, your light will expand from that point, you know? Mm. So that would become a survival mechanism for me. That became a tool that was useful for me and that became a gift that I could use and utilize and connect with. It's so important to believe in something. And that's what I share with everyone is like, believe in something, whether it's something higher, whether it's in yourself, whether it's life is my friend, just to have this one belief where which you can hold on to, especially during challenging times. And it's so beautiful that you found in the midst of everything at such young age, your pillar to hold on to. And it's and, and what an amazing mom as well to believe in you. And I was so deeply touched when you said earlier, I'm worthy of that belief. And it's and I really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I didn't, there were times when I didn't believe that. And so that's what I mean about when some, when, if, if you're, if you are lucky enough to have even just one person. And I think that's a message that I would say. If you've got people in your life, believe in them, love them, let them know they're worthy of, of everything. Let them know they're worthy of love and belonging because they might be in a period of time where they 
they don't feel that way about themselves. And by doing so, you're being the example and you're teaching them and encouraging them that they are and they might just one day get it. You know, sometimes we do need that, you know, and there are there are ways there are resources there are ways to to reach out if if you if you don't have that in your immediacy i mean i was really lucky and privileged to have that right there on my doorstep and it's not that way for everyone and i understand that you know but there are you know there are organizations there are groups there are people if that's why connection and reaching out is so important and i encourage people to reach out if you're in a situation and you don't feel you have that, there will be places of support to look to look for it. Sometimes we have to look really hard for stuff, but it's there. You know, that light that in the darkness that we're looking for, sometimes we have to look really hard for it. But it is there. And 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 it and by looking for it, it gave me purpose. It gave me more motivation. It gave me a way forward. It gave me you know, because you, if you stay in the darkness, that, that you're stuck. There's nowhere to go from there. You know, you're blocking yourself. There's n- there's nowhere to go. If you just find out, if you just find that moment again, I can take that back to Rocky. I can take that back to that flashback scene, and I can say a reason to go on, no matter how small it will grow. You know, and I think that that everyone deserves to feel that worthiness because everyone is worthy just by being here. The miracle that it took to get you to be alive is enough evidence to say that you are worthy of of love, belonging, life, health, everything, you know, good good that exists. I I, I fully believe that. You know, but we 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 neglect ourselves so much with that. Kirsty, I can see you are a rocky for a lot of people. (laughs) And I wanna I wanna touch upon a little bit your professional experience, uh, especially as a voice and communication coach. In your experience, how do you observe that? The, how is the link between confidence and body language? Because you're very in tune with your body, and you are. You talked a lot about confidence and being your own champion. And mm-hmm. I wonder what could you share about the link and how to build this the bridge. Well, as I said before, for a long time I was very disassociated with my body. I wasn't really in my body, and what I've in coming back to my body in a loving and nourishing way and being able to really be aware and, and bringing myself into alignment and a whole self connection. When we communicate, it really is a whole self experience. You know, we are using of our whole self to communicate. But oftentimes we're disconnected and oftentimes we're not in the exchange. We're outside of ourselves and we're, we're with the external. We're with perception. How am I being perceived? How is this going to come across? And, and so aligning with yourself is one of the most important things, I think, uh, in communication because it's it, that you are offering yourself. Communication is just a bridge for which you can offer yourself But then what you want to do is it's an exchange, right? So I'm welcoming you into my space. You're welcoming me into your space. And so I want to allow myself open to doing that. And then I need to be present with you. Because if I'm not present with you, if I'm thinking about why did I say that, why did I do that, that I'm backwards, I'm in the path, I'm not with you. If I'm forward thinking, what's going to happen next? And what, what what are they going to say? And what do they want? I'm not with you. I'm not listening to you. I'm not present with you. So then I'm not communicating authentically and fully and wholly and truly with you. And confidence is just, is just a knowing. You know, it's like, this is who I am. This is what I have to offer in this moment. This is all I've got. This is the facts of the situation. And running and and going with that and acknowledging yourself, so it's an acknowledgement of each other is the exchange. I wanted to to touch upon what you said. It's about being fully present and not worrying about what does another person think. It's actually a mantra that I'm using a lot for this podcast because I was very new to, especially the video and the recording and the light and everything. Uh, I'm used to being a speaker, but it's different because I don't need to light myself, you know? <laughs> so 
I remember one day I was doing my breathing exercises and I was really thinking, oh, okay, which light should I use this and that? And like, you know, how can I optimize it? And then there came a point during my breathing exercise that I had the thought, focus that it comes from the heart and then don't focus for it to be perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it needs to come from the heart. And that's something that I keep reminding myself because with technology and everything, there's always something that goes wrong. <laughs> so, and in the end, our mission is not to be perfect, but our mission is, you know, to be human and to show, to share our story and to have a good time and to communicate and, and inspire. I mean, that's, that's really what the mission and the journey is about. Everything else is just a bonus. No, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I mean, it, we are here having a human experience, you know, and I think I always think about if if something happened with someone else, if someone else forgot what they were going to say, if someone else had a technical problem, would I not be loving and forgiving of that te- of that issue? Would I not be loving mm. and grateful and, and compassionate? So why am I expecting there to be some issue going to come back at me if I have a fluff? If I have a if if I have a mental block and I and I don't remember what I was going to say or if I stumble over my words for a moment, like I haven't done that on purpose. That's human. If that happened to someone else, I'd absolutely be loving about it. So you know, I think it's that, and I also think that it's about when we come at things from a place of service. When I'm offering and I'm just here to offer something you know whatever that may be however helpful that may be I I focus my attention on that when I'm communicating and I always ask the people that I work with what's your intention what's your purpose for the communication what is it about because if it's something that is you know offering uh, you know being of service or being positively actionable it takes you away from all of the other noise because it is just noise all of the stuff around what do I look like what do I sound like and do they like me and well none of that's in alignment with with what I'm there to be of service with is it and if I stay in alignment with what's of service then I'm I'm on a it has momentum and I'm just here to give something you know, and Kirsty, what is your tip for? Because you you were talking about noise, and I think in our society, social media can create a lot of noise. What tip do you have for people regarding meaningful communication, especially the younger generation? Because you know they grew up with TikTok and Instagram and comparing themselves, whether it's what they wear, what they look like, and for most. I just know from my youngest brother, he was 14 years old and I remember they were studying for their maths exam and he was texting, 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 texting to the person trying to find the answer. And I'm like, why don't you just call? He's like, call? (laughs) Like he looked at me as if I was saying the weirdest thing ever. And it's for that generation. I really noticed and made me think, wow, talking is not their preference and they're also not that used to it they use all the emojis to understand what another person means or to express what they want to express do you have a tip for the younger generation or someone that is dealing with younger generation just for them to be more in touch with a heart-to-heart connection and to really have a meaningful communication and to have the courage to focus and noise cancel I mean, it's such a big thing these days. I think it is diminishing our interpersonal relationships because if someone can text or someone can just create a post or, you know, it is moving us away from that interpersonal communication that is the most valuable because we are at the center of everything. And I think sometimes that is being lost. I would, first of all, look at your why. You know, what, you know, especially if you're using social media platforms, what's your why? Why are you posting that? What is it for? Who is it for? Why? What is it? Is it if because if it's for the external things of ticking boxes and, 
validating and you know but if it's to establish something meaningful if it's to create an offering of oneself there's nothing more vulnerable i think now especially in today you know a lot of the people that come to work with me they have such vulnerability around just being themselves because of the expectations and demands being levied at them and the measuring stick that they're that they're looking at and i think a lot of it comes back to what we've already been talking about if you are your own internal measuring stick if you are aligning with yourself and what feels right to you and you're willing to just offer that genuinely and authentically now that can be a scary thing but what's going to happen is is it's going to actually bring you into alignment with the people that you're meant to be communicating with at that time because when you're misaligning in yourself you're going to misalign with people every single time so then you're going to be in surroundings where you don't feel it's really right for you where you're not feeling like you're fitting in and then you're going to try and make yourself fit into an arena that and blame yourself for that rather than actually aligning with yourself first connecting with what feels right to you get to know yourself what do you really think and feel genuinely by yourself and then take that out into the world in a deep and meaningful way and just be as present as you can with that and let things be because the other thing is is that you know this it comes back to the lose with no excuses thing we have no control over what someone else thinks of us or what their opinions are or you know we can only know whether or not we've offered of ourselves honestly because the other thing that happens when we don't align with ourselves and we're not connecting with ourselves and we try to be what we think everyone else wants us to be, even when we get what we think of as validation or likes or they're like, well, they don't really know me. They don't really know me. They don't really like me because I haven't shown them that. So even that love that I'm getting or that like that I'm getting I don't believe it because it's not true, because it's associated with a persona that I've created. It's not me. That's the language. That's the dialogue. But the minute you can align with yourself honestly and say, this is it, this is who I am, and you're worthy of that because that's that's who you really are and that's the gift that you're going to share and that's beautiful. That's gorgeous. When I see people coming into alignment with themselves and they speak wholly and truly and authentically as themselves, it's never more beautiful. They're never more wonderful. They're never more engaging. They're never more present. And so that's the other thing, being present with other people and recognizing that time is actually the greatest commodity and the most valuable commodity we have. So if you're going to give your time and they're going to give time, be in the now with that, be present, appreciate, gratitude, those things. You know, we're so busy looking at, you know, all the external validations that we're missing what is really beautiful and meaningful and valuable about communication and about connection because that's really what communication is about. It's about connecting. And connection is really valuable. But what what we really want is true, honest, you know, loving communication with each other you know and so it's about trusting yourself i think and we are really grateful that you are sharing your time with us and that you are fully present and you are open and offer us a very deep insight into the deepest corners of your heart and your soul and your journey and all the life lessons and before we end our conversation we have three dog-related questions for you. And they're very short. Don't worry. <laughs> if Adrian had a human job, what profession do you think she would love? Ooh, a human job. Genuinely, that's a, a very interesting question. But I think she has a very loving and sweet nature. So I think she'd probably... She'd probably go into a caring profession, some kind of caring profession. Either that or she'd work on a farm because she loves open spaces. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe she'd care for other animals and she'd be, she'd be like a farm vet or something like that, probably. Something like that, something loving and nurturing, but out in the world, out in the, out in the farmland for sure. So probably some sort of veterinary, yeah, but in a farm 
<laughs> scale. <laughs> I think something like that. that. That sounds beautiful. It's funny. I have never met your dog, but the way you described her, I also thought, oh, for sure, a, a, something in caring, being a nurse, being a doctor, looking after people. So that absolutely fit in the description you gave us earlier. Our next question. If you could ask Adrian one question, what would it be? To be honest, I would ask her what troubles you, little one, because when we're outside, she still has huge anxiety with outdoors in areas where there's traffic or cyclists or people with prams and buggies and you know things like that where anything unpredictable coming towards her she struggles with her anxiety so for me if I could actually ask her that and know and talk her through that because uh, it's a very diff different thing when we're dealing with anxiety in our pets you know with it's anxiety with a person we can kind of communicate something with them to find solutions but you know, when it's our pets and they can't articulate verbally like what is going on, what is creating the stress. And that's the only thing for me, you know, regardless of all what other magical wisdom she might have, my interest is in her well being. So I'm like, you know, if you could tell me, if you could tell me, little one, if you could just tell me what what's going on for you and then we could work it out together. That would be my conversation. Uh one thing I would love to add to this. So our brand, we have herbal remedies for cats and dogs. And our bestseller is Calm for Dogs. Because a lot of, especially rescue dogs, they have a lot of trauma and stress and anxiety. And as you said, for us humans, it's sometimes difficult to understand the root because we haven't been there when they had those experiences. And from my experience, What really helps is, and that's something you did for your own health journey, is combining herbal remedies or anything, you know, you believe in having a very good nutrition because the gut, you know, if there's a lot of carbs, a lot of gluten, like it does, and sugars especially, it spikes the anxiety. And then the third thing, similar to what you said, you did EDMR and meditation and breath work, there are such fantastic things you will experience if you do breath work with your dog okay right I yeah mean, we've it, not tried that <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing like doing breath work with your dog or also if you um, do chakra work i'm sure you probably did a lot on yourself the root chakra is related to i'm safe or i'm not safe you know, and I feel secure. I don't feel secure. And it's feeling this safety within themselves, especially when things are unpredictable on the outside. And that's what a lot of rescue dogs bring with themselves. They're scared of anything that's unknown. So new people, new surroundings, new dogs, Or anything that comes by very quickly because they don't know, is something going to hit me? Am I going to have another bad experience? And then it's very good in those moments. And I'm not a dog trainer. I'm just seeing it from a holistic point of view yeah. with um, our products and what we also, the guides that we are coming up with and the programs for our customers is being mindful in that moment and also like, you know, pausing Because I, and I'm sure you don't do that, but a lot of people are on their phones and they listen to podcasts and everything and just trying to be as present as possible with the dog yeah. because then we can already feel when is the anxiety building up and then just pausing. And then if they like it, patting them at the end of their tail, you know, like where, or at the end of the spine is actually correct to say, because that's where their root chakra is. And it's a point that really gives them a lot of safety and stability. And if you know there's a certain route where you're walking, it happens a lot. It's great to do these exercises already before you go. It's a little bit like when acting, you know, like you have your routines, your prep yeah. before you go on stage. <laughs> and that's how I see it with walks. Like you tune in with your dog. You make them feel comfortable before the stressors are rising. Amazing. No, that's fantastic. So I started doing, I, I, I started, I trained and got my, my Reiki certification and I started giving her 
Reiki to see if that would be helpful. But looking at, I never thought about looking at the the chakra system within a dog, and looking at her in that with you know looking at things energetically, but in that way, and so that's really really helpful in terms of how I will tune in a bit more. I was, that's it, amazing. It's, it's, so much. Re- it, it is. It really is amazing. Please keep me posted how you like it, because. I've talked to so many of our customers, also those ones who are new to chakras. So I'm trying to really explain it as, you know, like neutral as possible. So it doesn't sound all woo woo, but then they're like, wow, yeah, so true. These are all like, that's how my dog reacts or when they feel like they're not, you know, like when you go on a, a, a dog park and you, there are some dogs that are all by themselves. They feel like they don't fit in. And that's often the seventh chakra. They haven't found their place yet. And I find it just so interesting with all like also the separation, anxiety and everything, just to see it a little bit more holistically, because that helps us understanding, helps us to help. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a big step forward. So I have one more dog question. I know you have so many reasons, but what is one of the reasons you're grateful for your dog? The biggest reason I think it is everything that she, the gifts that she's given me and the lessons that she's taught me. So, you know, teaching me to be more patient, teaching me to be more compassionate, teaching me about my capacity to care. And if I'm able to give all of that to her, I'm, I'm then also able to give that to myself. And so she is a mirror and a reflection towards me I think and so I'm learning from her all the time I'm learning through her and through my relationship with her and the fact that she is unconditional love you know she gives way more than she receives absolutely and so cultivating that being just being love and that unconditional love and she's a shiny example of unconditional love and it's beautiful so yeah it's it's all it's all those it's all the big feelings (laughs) I love I love this answer because that's what this entire podcast is about. You know, bringing people on that have an amazing journey that are willing to share their time and their stories with us and are very open to the lessons they have learned from animals along the way. So it's really really beautiful and for the last questions, could I ask you to share your thoughts about the Purple Stars podcast? I mean, just everything you've said, I mean, just the whole ethos of that, just the ethos that you carry and that which you're sharing, because you're taking that out into the world with every conversation that you're having with people and the way in which you're connecting with people at that deep level and getting getting them to share of themselves in that way. And then you're spreading that out to your listeners. So it's taking a, a, a message and a, and a life experience and all the different people that you speak with and the experiences that they have, connecting that at a larger scale, at a deeper level with listeners. I mean, that is taking something and just spreading it out and letting it reach out, you know, and, that, and, and the world needs that. That's beautiful. It's beautiful the way that you set this up, the questions that you ask, you know. They're deep level questions. They're beautiful questions. And that is making a deeper connection with people. It's make, it's looking at the core connection. I think that's it. If I sum it up that way, you look at the core connection for people to connect with each other, to connect with themselves and to connect with each other in a loving way. Is that if, if I sum Thank up you right? so much. <laughs> no, that, it, it, it's beautiful because... It it makes me very happy because our vision is to build a very big Purple Stars family, you know, where we inspire each other and where we give each other comfort and where we guide each other towards happier and more meaningful lives, both for us and our furry friends and family members. So that you feel and perceive that way makes me very, very happy because that's our mission and our vision we work on very hard very every day so it's it's really great Kirsty thank you so much for your time and for being so open and vulnerable with us and just sharing 
so many wisdom of nug nuggets of wisdom, whether it's the Rocky philosophy, your health journey, your very sweet, loving rescue dog. I'm sure people absolutely loved our conversation. So thank you very, very much. Oh, no, thank you so much for asking me and for giving of your time in this way. No, I really appreciate it. It's been an absolute joy. I've really loved it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a wrap for today, everyone. If you liked our conversation, please share it with your friends and your family. And don't forget to tag us, both Kirsty and us, to keep the conversation going. And we're very excited to see you next Wednesday.